Hi, everyone. I'm Serena Dairam. I am CNET's Asia Senior Editor, and I am here today with uh, Mirta Goskar, the Acting Managing Director of GFI APAC. Hey, Mirta, how are you doing today? Hello, Serena. I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, so uh, you are obviously representing GFI here. Um, you know, there. this is an industry event, so many of us will already know uh, what GFI is. But for those attendees who don't, please, you know, quickly share with us what exactly it is that GFI does. Yeah. So GFI is a global network of nonprofits accelerating the markets for alternative proteins. And you can think of us as a think and do tank to um, develop uh, the roadmap for a more sustainable, more secure, more just alternative uh, or protein supply, which we feel is alternative protein. Um, and we do that through our work with industry, with academia and governments. Cool, so you're the perfect person to talk to about, I guess, the current state of the plant-based meat, cultivated meat and fermentation markets. You know, what are your thoughts on the current state? And could you just give us, you know, a quick snapshot? Yes, it's a, it's a big question, but um, let me share. Uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> it is. I think that, that is possible. Um, so we saw um, record investments um, last year, 5 billion US dollars in the global alternative protein industry, which was 60% more than the year before. And investments in cultivated and fermentation enabled proteins were tripling. Um, the growth in investment numbers has actually been bigger here in Asia Pacific, um, where plant-based foods are still um, the major um, share of those investments. Um, and what's interesting, if we're looking at last decade's investment numbers, um, we see an unmistakable trend. So where uh, a decade ago, North America was still accounting for nearly 100% of the global alternative protein investments, their share has now fallen to two thirds. So we're shifting east. Um, now, looking at some of the uh, retail dollar sales, for global plant-based meat, and they grew with 17% in 2021 to 5.6 billion. Uh, globally, we saw an increase in companies dedicated to uh, produce proteins using fermentation technology and cellular agriculture of respectively 21%, 24%. In the US, the number of plant-based companies grew with 13%. Regulations um, still lag behind in many places. Um, so they really need to catch up with the rapid innovation that we see on the ground. Um, but overall, I would say the industry is really booming, um, but there's also a lot of room for improvement um, for many of the products that are currently out there. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I might digress a bit, but, um, you know, plant, the plant, you were saying plant based, I believe the plant based meats um, saw kind of a plateau last year. Do you know uh, why that might be? Yeah, so I think it's um, important to understand that um, if we're looking between 2020, 2021, it's a special year. It was the COVID year. We saw many disruptions in conventional animal meat supply chains, which led to higher sales numbers for the plant-based meat products. Um, so it would be wise to look at the larger trends instead of comparing numbers to the pandemic year. So in the long term, we still see um, plant-based uh, uh, the plant-based category grow, and we don't expect that to um, to plateau. So you're saying it's sort of a blip in the overall, um, you know, upward trajectory of all proteins. Um, so I just wanted to ask, you know, what do you think is not reported enough by the media or what is the industry not talking about enough that we should be when it comes to the alternative protein industry? Um, good question. So one of the most important things to realize, I think, for all of us is the influence that governments can have in developing an industry. Like we've seen with electric vehicles, with vaccine development, uh, once governments go all in, things start moving much faster than expected. So it's, it's a priority that governments adopt alternative proteins as a climate solution and collaborate with the industry to accelerate the diversification of the protein supply. I think we can all play a role in that, but governments definitely can play a role in that. And that segues right in perfectly well into my next question. You know, how, how, you know, what, what is, how are governments in Asia supporting the industry? You know, what does the regulation look like? I know Singapore is a, is a leader. Um, so how, how are Asian governments kind of supporting the alt protein industry and how does that compare to the US? Yeah, so let me dive into both um, financial support and, and regulatory support, right? So we see actually 
couple of great examples um, here in the region, um, the, ma the massive public investment from um, the Australia government and the South Australia government to quadruple the alternative protein uh, manufacturing capability in South Australia. It's a great example. Um, China just released their first five-year bioeconomy development plan, which includes a call to explore synthetic protein or alternative proteins as a way to reduce the pressure on environmental resources brought about by conventional animal agriculture. Um, 2021 was also the first year in which we saw um, multiple governments awarding large amounts of funding towards cultivated meat research, um, including Israel, the European Union, and uh, the United States. Um, and then if we look uh, more specifically into regulations, we all know, I think that Singapore is um, the country with the most comprehensive novel food regulatory framework, um, the only country that has approved to uh, cultivate meat products for sale. Um, but there are other countries that are working on their novel food regulations too. So um, a good example is JECA in Japan, so the Jap Japanese Association for Cellular Agriculture, which is an industry academia government collaboration that creates rules for cultivated proteins. Oh, wow. um, but what's also very interesting is that countries like Singapore, for, ex for example, are uh, working with FAO, so the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, to disseminate um, their knowledge to other countries. And we also see um, countries like Singapore and Australia, for example, looking into harmonization of their regulatory um, uh, yeah, framework. So, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot uh, going on. Um, and if we compare it to the U.S., uh, I, yeah, I, I, I do believe that um, within the next six to 12 months, um, we will see the first approvals for cultivated meat sales in the U.S. Uh, too. Oh, that's good news. Um, you talked about, you seem, you know, you seem, from what I understand you saying, a lot of the countries you um, mentioned seem pretty receptive and open. Where, what parts of the world are you not seeing this sort of openness? Where, where, where does, you know, or is it, you know, pretty... Um, you know, our, our, our countries, most countries around the world realizing, okay, that we need to reduce our meat consumption in order to um, prevent uh, climate change. To help more and climate more change. so. Yeah, more and more so. Um, we co-organized a, a workshop last year with uh, WHO um, to educate the West Pacific offices um, mm -hmm. on alternative proteins and um, I, I, I was like, it was fantastic to see the support from senior leadership to put this on the agenda as a climate solution. Um, but there was also a lot of, uh, a lot of room for more uh, learning and, and teaching from our side. Um, yeah, I think there's also many regulators around uh, the region and probably around the globe that um, still need to, yeah, need to get up to speed on this topic because it is quite a technical and, uh, and, and yeah. Not, not, not an easy topic for everybody, right? You need to take quite a big, <laughs> bit of a deep dive to understand everything around like food safety, um, and, yeah, food safety regulations and the impacts on uh, food security as, as well, of course. Well, we did speak about how Singapore is a leader and I know you have some relevant news to share about some of GFI's work there. Let's hear it. Yeah, so um, thank you. <laughs> I'm super <laughs> excited to announced uh, the launch of a first of its kind web page that reveals all Singapore government funding schemes available to global alternative protein startups. Um, so to spotlight all of the, the knowledge and infrastructural resources that food companies can leverage to build their business, um, we have created an easy to use like one-stop shop database in collaboration with Food Innovate. And Food Innovate is an uh, initiative launched by Enterprise Singapore and um, together with ASTAR, with um, EDB, JTC Corporation, IPI, um, and, uh, and the Singapore Food Agency. Um, and it is really set up so that instead of going through all these different agencies as a startup and finding the different um, support systems, you can actually go into this database and then find anything that you're looking for. So what, what are the things, you know, a startup could search? You know, is it finding talent? Is it if I need a specific product for a you know, a plant food I'm developing. Uh, could you give us some examples? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so as a startup, you can either search by need. So for example, uh, yeah, bringing in foreign talents, what kind of schemes are there available? Um, you're looking for upstream R&D funding. 
anything, you can just look for uh, for need, and I can I can mention the needs um, that you can that you can search. So there's talent and skills, R and D, financing, networking, infrastructure, regulations, and market access. Uh, and secondly, you can also search by development stage. So if you're not exactly sure what you're looking for, but you know you're in pilot stage, you can just look for um, all the support that Singapore government can offer you um, in this stage of development of your startup. Um, and then lastly, what I also think is interesting is that we clearly identified which schemes are available for local startups and which are available for global startups. Okay, so this is a tool for not just Singaporean startups, but for, you know, uh, all protein startups all around the world. Um, so good to know. Um, um, now we're going to back up a bit. And actually, I wanted to ask, and this is kind of a personal question for me. Um, I became a mom recently, four months ago. And for me, reading about the infant uh, formula shortage uh, in the US was heart wrenching, but also eye opening, because it showed just how fragile the supply chain is. Um, you know, we had Abbott Nutrition shut down one of its leading facilities and, you know, the, the effects of that, uh, the consequences of that were very real for a lot of mothers in the US. And so, you know, this is a bit of a di digression, but how can uh, the alternative dairy industry help? When do you think we will see an infant formula on the market made with human breast milk proteins or other options from what we already have? I know timelines are a bit tough to predict, but if you could give us something ballpark or just tell us how you think the alternative dairy industry can help apart from, you know, uh, giving an extra option. First of all, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, I was very excited to become a mom. I'm a mom of three. Um, so I know <laughs> all about breastfeeding stress and formula. Yeah. Um, but no, the, uh, the example that one. you gave is, uh, yeah, is, is a very strong example and, and horrific example, of course. Um, it showcases how vulnerable we actually are to food security issues, even in, in the most developed uh, countries. Um, so yeah, that, that is why we see companies, right, like Turtle Tree uh, here in Singapore or Helena in the US jump on the opportunity to, to develop solutions that are more, not just more sustainable and more safe from a, from a food safety perspective, but also uh, more reliable to young families. Um, having that said, the, the field is, is still very, very nation, yes. nascent. So um, uh, Turtle Tree announced last year that their first commercially scalable ingredient, human lactoferrin, which offers uh, immunity benefits, um, would be targeting the infant nutrition uh, market, amongst others. But yeah, timelines, it's, it's so difficult. I, I think yeah. that if you're also getting to three babies, Serena, maybe <laughs> by you then. might be able to rely on alternative infant formula by, by the last one. But uh, <laughs> yeah, things, things go fast, but timelines are just, yeah, difficult because there's yeah. lots, of, lots of stages, um, both on the innovation, the scale, yeah, that we, 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 there, there's more room um, um, for innovation, then you need to skill up the industry, you need to also uh, get through all the regulatory uh, loops. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I, no, I know it's, it's, tough, it's a tough question, but I understand, I, I believe um, Turtle Tree is setting up or has set up a facility in California. So I think um, uh, there are moves being made in that direction. Um, but let's talk about GFI before we wrap up. Um, you know, give us, you know, give us an idea of what else is coming up of GFI in the next six months. What should we look out for? Um, I think one of the most exciting things is that we will uh, launch in Q1 next year, uh, the first state of the industry report for Southeast Asia. So oh. I think we're well known for our state of the industry reports on the global level and our uh, GFI Israel has uh, created their state of the industry reports now twice. Um, but yeah, I'm very stoked that we will uh, launch one focused specifically on, on Southeast Asia. But there's there's much more that we're working on. Uh, among the deep dive, we're oh. working as an official partner um, to the constituent events of the Singapore International Agri Food Week uh, on a few uh, solutions that we've created work groups around and address um, cultivated proteins, consumer education, uh, supply chain disruptions, uh, uh, talent shortness, shortness in the market. So there is a, there's a lot that we're working on and a lot to be, uh, yeah, to be expected. Maybe one more thing. Um, we also soft launched already GF Ideas APAC, which we will um, yeah, celebrate uh, and, and officially launch later uh, 
I think in, in about August, um, which is an online platform where industry uh, players can connect, share, learn, um, and also the, the startup, uh, the Good Food Startup Manual uh, edition 2.0, where we also include um, basically a, a, a static version of the one-stop shop that we've created on our website, but all the Singapore government resources available uh, will also be launched uh, in the next two months or so. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff coming up. A lot of content or a lot of research, I should say, to refer to for us journalists and, you know, I guess the broader industry. Um, but yeah, if, you know, we'll probably leave it there. But before we do, uh, is there anything else you wanted to add before we, we wrap up this conversation? Well, so for all alternative protein startups, where you are in the world, browse to our one-stop shop um, to see what Singapore has to offer you. And um, for everyone else, whether you're working in government or in a corporate, we can all adopt alternative proteins as a climate solution and do our bit to create a, a more sustainable, more secure and more just protein supply. Cool. We'll leave it there. Thanks for joining us today, Amirta. And thanks to Enterprise Singapore and Brink for putting together this event. Bye. Thanks so much, Serena.